These are general dentistry practices that may have a supplement of some specialty procedures, typically in an operatory, operatory size of five to seven ops, with one doctor, maybe a part-time associate. And those dentists are taking home a million dollars a year. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Raving Patients podcast, sponsored by Cloud Dentistry. As you know, I'm your host, Dr. Len Tao, and today I'm actually super excited to have someone who I've known in the dental industry for a long time. I met him at a meeting um, many years ago. Uh, we're finally connecting to uh, bring you his expertise to the audiences. His name is Scott Looney, and Scott, welcome to the Raving Patients podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. You have a very interesting background in dentistry. I, if I remember correctly, you, you you had a practice. I think you got injured um, and kind of pivoted and started an entirely different concept. Uh, you've taught thousands and thousands of dentist, uh, dentists how to you know do startup practices, how to run their business. So, can you for for the listeners who who don't know who you are, which I'd be shocked if they don't, but if they don't know who you are, can you give a little bit of about your background because it's a very intriguing uh, background in, in my my opinion. Sure. Yeah, I started a uh, startup practice right out of school in 2005. And shortly after I opened it, I fractured a couple vertebrae in my back, which led me to then have to be in and out of a wheelchair for the next 11 years. Um, so I had to quickly go from being a working dentist in my startup to being more of a business person and an entrepreneur within dentistry. My startup practice was seeing 350 new patients a month. So it was growing heavily. Um, I opened several more practices, eventually having about 90 employees, uh, 10 associates, and I sold those three locations uh, three years after I graduated and did very, very well from the sale. I since then went and built uh, many, many, many more practices, have sold them. I've also been involved in building uh, dental call centers and billing and insurance, marketing, IT, even architecture and design, uh, just have done a lot in dentistry. And uh, what's, what's kind of been unique about my situation is that while I was forced into the business side, I really um, decided to make my career all about helping the private dentist from the business side rise up, compete with and ultimately outperform the DSO. And so today, my organization um, has over 20,000 dental practices, private dentists using us in some way to help lift them up above the DSO. And the typical dentist that gets involved with me has usually come to one of my intense business training courses. They, they last two days. They're 400 pages of content. And from there, I teach them how to build and, and manage practices that, and have them take over a million dollars take home pay, you know, home to their family every year. And that leads them to potentially uh, working with my company in other ways. That's a phenomenal story. Like I said, I knew part of it. I didn't know the whole thing, but um, I've been someone who's, who's watched you grow over the years. I, I remember you on Dentaltown and you're posting all your stuff in the very beginning. So we're going to be focused today on growing Growing dental practice profits is what we're going to be talking about. So for those listening and watching, you know, this is someone you want to really pay attention to. So let, let's focus on the, a couple of the, the topics that we want to, that you wanted to speak to. One of the things that resonates with me is, a, you know, dentists taking home over $1 million. You know, that you just said it just now. And, you know, to the, to the, the average dentist who may be listening to it, you know, they're thinking, well, well, I may, I may, you know, produce a million dollars, but I'm not, Taking home anywhere near a million dollars. So can can you can you really just just nail right there? You know how you know, and obviously you know you give a class, you give a workshop, whatever you're calling it, to, to these docs to to get them on the path to do that. But can you share some of the tips, some 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 things to so these doctors can understand how, how that can possibly happen? Yeah, I can tell you there is a growing group of dentists doing this, taking home over a million dollars. I mean, I've got ten dentists I personally coach. All of them, almost no, not all of them, almost all of them take home over a million dollars. That is take home pay. So they might be collecting in their practice $2 million or a little more than that, taking home a million. Um, you know, it, of course, we can get into really detailed, complicated systems of uh, presenting finances and case acceptance and scheduling and marketing and, you know, how, how you get the patients to come in and diagnosing. I mean, there's so many things that impact taking home a million dollars. 
But simplistically speaking, maybe that's really where we should all start because there's so much truth in the simple stuff. Uh, simplistically speaking, take home pay comes from what you collect minus what you spend. And so we need to build a roadmap that gets us to collect more without spending more, maybe spending less, right? And so if we were to create a strategy of taking home a million dollars take home pay, that strategy would involve producing and collecting more, the things that impact that, and spending less. It's not uncommon, for example, for a dentist that's taking home a million dollars take home pay to only have maybe 15% staff overhead. That's low. And those team members, though, are getting paid a lot per team member. But the difference is they are, the practice is producing much more per team member than a typical practice. And these practices where dentists take home over a million dollars, these are not what you might think. These are not mega offices, 15 ops, multiple doctors doing, you know, all on fours all day long. That is not what this is. These are practices that may not even be in big cities. These are general dentistry practices that may have a supplement of some specialty procedures, typically in an operatory, operatory size of five to seven ops with one doctor, maybe a part-time associate. And those dentists are taking home a million dollars a year. So, you know, people always speak to me as, you know, how do they, how do they become more profitable? And as you said, there's really only two ways to do it. You either have to produce more dentistry or lower your expenses, lower your overhead. And you just mentioned that you said that some of these practices have, have a 15% staff overhead. Um, just so the, just so people can con conceptually understand that, um, you know, the typical practice is, is 20 to 22. And I know practices that are well over 30% staff overhead. So, you know, that, that, that is people are going to hear that and they're going to say, well, well, that's, that's pretty phenomenal how you can get staff overhead, the staff number down so low. And if you can do that, you really can drop the whole overhead of the practice. So that's the biggest expense most people have is staffing. So can you, can you just talk a, a little bit about that and how someone does that? Yes, you're, you're, you're producing, remember, if you produce a lot of money, you can always lower your overhead as well because you're, you're producing so much more. So can you just, just touch base on that, on that, um, the staffing uh, overhead numbers that you were just talking about? Yeah, the staffing overhead is mostly, in our model at least, mostly a function of how much we produce. Because whether we are doing a filling or a crown or an implant, we still need that dental assistant right next to us. Yet a filling, crown, implants, Purdue, those are some much different production numbers. So for us, staff overhead usually is a function of what we produce, although of course we could be overstaffed. Of course we could be overpaying people. That's usually not what it is. And when we look at, okay, producing more without hiring more staff, that comes from diagnosing more dentistry. And that comes from being able to get case acceptance on that dentistry that we diagnose. And ultimately being able to fit it in the schedule to where we become very productive without burning out, right? So those are three very big things to talk about. Diagnosing more um, and then, of course, getting case acceptance so that what we diagnose gets on the schedule. And then, of course, understanding how to manage the schedule so that the day becomes productive without us running 100 miles an hour. When we can accomplish those three things, then it's easy to show some staff overhead number as really low on a profit and loss statement because our day is efficiently full of the dentistry that we diagnosed. Right. And, and that dental assistant, no matter what we pay them, proportionally becomes a very affordable cost to the business. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense to me. I, I mean, obviously, uh, the goal here is to make sure that the, the listeners and the viewers understand what you're saying there. Um, so I, I agree a hundred percent with, I mean, we're on the same wavelength here. You know, again, you raise collections through diagnosis, case acceptance. Um, and obviously you have to have a system in place to do that. I'm curious. Um, from a case acceptance perspective, what do you consider from a numbers, you know, percentage numbers, great case acceptance, good case acceptance, poor case acceptance, you know, and what is your definition of case acceptance? Because I think you speak to different people, they will tell you, you know, is, do they have to accept a whole treatment plan? Do they have to accept only a, a part of the treatment plan? So I'm curious your, your ideas on this. Yeah, well, I define case acceptance by what the metrics tracking software defines it. Right. So there's a, there's a handful of software companies that 
create dashboards around our practice numbers so that we can understand things like case acceptance or hygiene reappointment rate, you know, numbers like that, that aren't in Dentrix or Open Dental or EagleSoft. So those companies define case acceptance as did the patient say yes to at least one thing they need? If, if they need four crowns and a filling, if they said yes to one crown, that's case acceptance. That Of course, we want them to say yes to more than that, but that's a different number. Case acceptance is did they say yes to something? And from my experience, most dentists have no idea what their case acceptance is. They assume it's a lot higher than it really is. In, in our model, when we have a 65% case acceptance or higher, we are happy. That is something we say is good. Um, 65% is good. And there's a lot of things that impact case acceptance, though. It's not just what the doctor says. It's payment options. It is what the form even looks like. It's the room we present finances in. It's the use of certain case acceptance tools, even. Um, there, and of course, urgency statements from the doctor or from the treatment coordinator. Phasing of treatment so that, you know, the, the new patient isn't hit with sticker shock. All of those things can impact case acceptance. And they are all ingredients of this practice that takes home a million dollars take home pay per year. And again, we're speaking the same language here. So we're, I'm on the same page with you. So you mentioned something, obviously case acceptance is affected by a number of different things. You mentioned the room they're in. You mentioned the person who, who obviously is presenting the treatment, if they're not effective in doing it, you know, just so you know, and, I, and I'm very straightforward about this, when I first bought my practice, I bought my practice in 2007. Um, I, we didn't discuss it before, but I sold in 2021. So I was there 14 years. The first year plus, I had an office manager who just was not good at case acceptance, and I got rid of her. I got I fired her, and I took it over myself. So I don't know how you feel about the doctor presenting treatment and finances versus uh, someone in the office doing it, but I took that role upon in my office, and I teach a lot of doctors the way I do things because I was very different than, than what the gurus say, which is someone else has to do it. So I, I'm in full agreement with you that. I'm, I'm curious um, – you talked about finances. You talked about how you present finances. So how how much are you recommending practices run through third-party finances? How much are you rec recommending you know, cash payment discounts? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. First, really, there's a question we have to ask before that. We have to ask ourselves, is our schedule, is it, does it have holes in it or is it slammed? When a schedule has holes in it, then the variable cost of adding dentistry is very, very low. Meaning we've already paid for that empty chair. We've already paid for that dental assistant to stand there. We've already paid for the rent, the taxes and utilities to be open that day. Putting a crown patient there, the only variable cost to that is materials cost. Putting an implant patient, putting an endo or surgery, right? So very low cost and therefore very high profit margin of that added procedure in an empty chair. And when we have that, we can have more um, flexible payment options, more flexible office policies even, to try to bring in volume of patients to fill our schedule. And that is where profit lies. That's much different than a practice that's slammed, booked out way too long. There's no space in the schedule. For that practice, we need to have stronger practice policies that only bring in patients that show up and spend more, in essence, and we might have more strict financial options that limit our risk because we could replace that patient that can't pay, that can't show, that can't do much dentistry with another patient that can. So when we look at the financial strategy of this practice, you know, that practice is going to make different decisions. Now, most practices have holes in the schedule. Most practices do want volume of dentistry coming in so that they can grow. And in that case, we, um, we have payment options that no matter what the patient picks is good for the practice. They can pay up front. That's good for the practice. They can use third-party financing. There's several companies that do that. That's good for the practice. They could also go on a payment plan through a third party with a guaranteed payment to the practice. And those options really speak to these three patient types. The patient with money, the patient with good credit, and the patient with poor credit. And about half of our patients are the third type, the patient with poor credit. And in most offices, that's the type that we are sh accidentally shunning from our policy standpoint. We don't have a good payment option for the patient that doesn't get approved for third-party financing. But that patient needs work. They want work. If we can have a payment option 
that limits our risk, we can fill that empty chair with that low variable cost set of procedures coming from that patient. So I'm curious, is there, and, and I'm a, I run a, a workshop called thir, uh, The Art of Third Party Financing, The Art of Dental Financing, I call it. So I'm, I'm familiar with all these companies. Is there, is there a specific, um, within your group, is there a specific um, third party financing company you recommend to hit those low credit people? You know, we've, we've used a handful of companies. And now when I say group, Dennis need to understand listening to this that um, my organization today, I said we've got 20,000 dentists that use us in, in, in North America. We've also owned practices through a DSO structure. Although we're not like a typical DSO, in our DSO, we have partners, true partners that are all clinical dentists. Um, and so we, we have kind of these two sides of the table, one helping dentists grow and the other one helping our own practices grow. And when I say we've used third-party companies, I'm talking about our practices nationwide that, that we help uh, through a DSO relationship. And so I'll list a bunch of companies off. Um, I, I prefer not to pick favorites right now. That's fine. Pod, I understand. But I'd be happy to list different companies off, and I'll do that very quickly right now. Um, there's company, and, and all of these companies have different products, but they all have something for that patient type. Completely different products, completely different ways of addressing that patient that has poor credit. So some of these companies are Denefits, Sunbit, Viridi, ClearGage, Comprehensive Finance. Those are examples of companies that do something for that patient type. And I think and that, I can tell you that we've had very lucrative results in practices where we've We've gone into the practice and one of the things we implement is a payment option for the patient with poor credit. Uh, the growth happens very quickly, especially when you combine that with the proper structure form, the proper room, the proper verbiage, all these proper things, these best practices around case acceptance. And, and I'm glad you listed some of those because some of those I was not aware of, I've heard of, but I was not aware of how they work as much. But um, I think the, the moral of this story, and I think you'd agree with this because you said it is that you have to have some some payment option for those people who don't have great credit because otherwise they're walking out and they're never doing treatment. So and as you said, if you if you have the room in the for them, your the profitability on these is 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 tremendous because you're already paying the expenses during the day. So Yeah, you're right, but I'm gonna be a weird jerk for a second. Uh, none of us have to do anything, right? And the the sickness we have in dentistry as owners is is we're all doing pretty well. So it's hard to say I need to get better. It's hard to say what I have that works needs to go away. I need to do something new. And that's the sickness we're in. A whole lot of us, things we do every day work. And what we don't understand maybe is there's a much better way to do them. And that's the real challenge we have in implementation on the business side of dentistry is unwinding the things that work in order to wind up something that, may, that does better. And so all of us are doing pretty well in dentistry, comparatively speaking, not addressing this opportunity. But when you do, oh, my goodness, you can really do better. And, you know, our organization is not for the typical practice, the typical dentist. We, we, we don't accept these kind of guru stated standards and rules. We've got enough data. We understand what really is possible, and what we really do need to strive for. So we have a very kind of far-reaching, more mature kind of outlook on the business side of dentistry. Um, it's amazing when you have the right data, the right information, how your entire outlook changes. And so, you know, accepting three or $400,000 take-home pay, we don't accept that. that. That is not enough at all. There's no reason why it has to be that low, for example. Great information there. Um, so another topic we want to talk about, and, and again, it comes to uh, profitability and, and raising the amount of money the practice uh, collects is using hygiene for that model and, and taking a hygienist and giving them, you know, a, a ability to, to make more money for the practice. So I know that's a touch point for a lot of people. You know, labor is hard to get right now. The hygienists are, are asking for a tremendous amount more money than they were before. So can you touch base on a little bit on the hygiene department of the practice? Yeah, sure. It is maybe the most profitable part of the practice we've ever seen. And that goes completely against this notion that it's the lost leader of the industry, right? Um, and yeah, hygienists right now are commanding very, very high pay levels. And that's, so, of course, you know, that's not necessarily good for the financial health of the practice compared to the way it was. But I'll tell you that when you run a solid hygiene department, you can afford 
to pay a competitive wage, not just an average wage, a competitive wage in today's market. Our hygienists typically produce 3,000 a day. Uh, some will do more than that. Some will do less than that. They typically do 3,000 a day. That is adjusted production. That's not fake fantasy UCR production, all right? That's real adjusted production, about 3,000 a day. And they are paid a very strong wage for their area, and they are given an opportunity to earn a commission if they surpass their production goals for the week. And what that does is it puts the hygienist in a frame of mind where when the day gets tough, do we reschedule the patient or not? Do I knock out the fillings today or not? Am I going to make sure we've taken all the x-rays we're supposed to take today or not? In that moment, because of how we've aligned their, their money with the practice's money, they tend to step on the gas and do what's best for everyone. And in addition, we train them on, on preventative, on how to talk to patients about sealants and fluoride and x-rays, as well as perio. And without becoming some, you know, super hygienist, they just follow these very simple uh, strategies and they just do really well. And uh, maybe half of our hygienists today are assisted, uh, which also then will drive their production up. But we've got a way of doing assisted hygiene that hygienists love. Problem is a lot of hygienists in the past have experienced assisted hygiene and it left a bad taste in their mouth. Um, in our model, uh, we really worship really the hygienist and, and how their day um, happens. And we, we really respect their amount of training and we use those things to help drive up case acceptance and to help drive up their own production. When a hygienist is producing $3,000 a day, paying them a little bit more per hour because that's what the market says we have to do is not a big deal. No, it's easy. Um, you know, I wish every dentist would produce $3,000 a day sometimes, you know. So, uh, we, you know, it makes a lot of sense for us. <laughs> to give the hygienist hygiene nirvana in our practice where they're just super happy and to set them up in an environment where they're very productive for the practice. Love that. I think that's a huge thing you just said. Cause I think that, you know, unfortunately, and I'll say this cause I'm a dentist and so are you, you dentists have blinders on and they don't look at the big picture when it comes to things. And if they're producing, if they can get their hygienist to produce $3,000 a day, they can easily raise what they're paying them and make the, the, the hygienist happy and the practice runs efficiently. So I agree with you hundred percent there. Um, the other way we talked about to make more money is to reduce expenses. So I'm curious what your your thoughts or feelings were in, in some of the ways that practices could look at their – and by the way, just so you know, there's so many dentists I speak with and I talk to so many dentists because I, I represent bird eye and I do so many other things. There are so many dentists, I ask them a question like, what is their adjusted production? And they, they, they're dumbfounded. They have no idea. They don't even, some people ask me, they don't even know what that is. So I think, you know, you have to know your numbers to run a business efficiently. I think you'd agree with that. So, um, what are some of the ways they don't even know their overhead total? It's crazy. So what are some ways that these practices can, can reduce, um, uh, reduce expenses? Dentists that don't know their numbers, it's kind of like doing dentistry without x-rays. The problems you see, you can see with your naked eye. That's actually, that's when the problems got big enough to get seen by your naked eye. Right. That's dentists that don't know their numbers. They don't run their numbers. They don't see problems until they've been embezzled for a year or until collections has dried up from insurance. Right. So so that's the problem with it. Even though those things are bad, they can still make decent living doing it that way. It's just what we're really talking about, I think, on this podcast is to the dentists that are ready to become uh, maybe have a higher level of maturity in how they manage their multimillion dollar company as a CEO. And in that kind of company, you need to know what's going on. You need to have these financial x-rays of your practice so that you can see where the opportunities lie. Um, and, you know, it's kind of like if driving a car without, without a speedometer. I mean, you, you can kind of go with the flow of traffic, but if you don't know exactly how fast you're going, you know, you, you might get a ticket. You might run, in, run into some problems or, or you might not be going as fast as you should. So this dentist that we're talking about is mature enough to know they need to get the numbers or they already have the numbers. And when they have those numbers, they then need to see where the opportunities are to lower costs. And I can tell you that profit is immediately made when you lower costs. Profit isn't necessarily immediately made when you raise your production. So lowering costs is a sure way to make profit. And one unfortunate sickness we have in dentistry is dentists today are typically spending eight to nine percent of their collections on dental supplies. And that is uh, sickening to me. We spend 3.8 percent as an entire DS organization, 3.8 percent. So if we have, you know, uh, 
a $2 million practice spending 4% and you have a $2 million practice spending 8%, I'm taking home 80 grand a year more purely because I took one day to clean it up. 80 grand a year for the rest of my career, I take home more per, year, per, per than you do. So supplies is a big one. And it's not, it's not rocket science to fix supplies. It involves, uh, first of all, being part of a buying group uh, so that you get the lowest prices possible. You know, we have a buying group at Dental Whale. It's one of the biggest in the country. But there's other ones as well. The second thing that we have to have is we have to pick the right brands and put that on our list of stuff that's approved. That's called a formulary. We have to have a formulary that leads the office into saying, look, buy the green gloves. Don't buy the purple gloves. I know we have purple scrubs. Don't buy the purple gloves. Because they match, they cost double, right? We have to have a formulary that leads them to do that. And then finally, the most important thing is we have to enforce a budget. And I don't know if dentists have ever heard that budget. before in their life. Budget. What's a budget? <laughs> but believe it or not, when you're a CEO of a multi-million dollar company and you're operating at a high level, taking home a million dollars, you're enforcing a budget. And that budget is 4% of collections. So no order gets placed unless... It is approved and it's never approved unless it's 4% of collections or less. That alone, without even being part of buying group or cleaning up your formulary, that alone will dramatically reduce your supply costs, just enforcing the budget. And overnight, boom, you're making 40 to 80 grand a year, more profit. And that is your family's money. That is what the fund you're setting up for your kid's college, your retirement plan. I mean, that... That's for you. That is not to give up an inefficient, irresponsible spending of buying purple gloves. So that, that's one area. Um, there's a lot of little things on the P&L that add up to big things. So many practices are spending $199 a month on this and on that, on the other, not understanding that technology's changed. And many times you can bundle services together and cancel a bunch of the stuff you're spending money on. Um, a lot of practices haven't gone after their lab fees properly. They are ordering products that are too expensive and they're ordering them from labs that are too expensive and they're not part of a buying group again where they could even get it cheaper. I mean, I don't know what y'all spend on Bruxer Crowns, but we spend $39 a unit. And I bet it's the same freaking lab everyone else uses. Um, and, and so that's possible, right? But it involves a dentist sitting down and actually doing something to create change in their practice, to free up all this money. I, I think it's really hard to take home a million dollars when you don't know your numbers and you're wasting money on expenses. And then you're just complaining to the world. You wish you could find a great team uh, and you know costs are going up and the DSOs are hurting you. And you know what, what I find, by the way, is I've never found a great team member that I know of. I don't know how to. What I know how to do is to create an environment in, in the company where people become great, you know? And so I don't know how to find great people, but I know how to make the practice set up so that people rise up to their, hopefully their best and become great. And uh, the dentist needs to do the same thing. The, you know, I shouldn't even call him a dentist. I think who we're speaking to is the CEO who happens to cut teeth too much, right? So, and they're not a CEO enough. Right. And, and so that's that's really the problem. There's only so much you can do as a tooth cutter in running your company without giving your company the time or the budget or the implementation project or the tracking. And at some point, you got to become a CEO. I absolutely love that. And, you know, doing dentistry is the easy part. You know, running a practice is the hard part. Running the business is the hard part of that. The cutting the teeth is the easy part. And, and I think that you just in, in the 27 minutes or 26 minutes that we, we've started talking about the content here, you, you laid a path for someone to make a hell of a lot more money. So, you know, before we, we switch to the one section, I wanted to go over by asking you a couple of uh, questions. You know, something else I think we wanted to touch on was, you know, the business owners, the CEOs of the practice, they lose focus. They don't pay attention. So I, I know that one of the things you want to touch on was, was keeping a, keeping an owner focused on certain things. Can you, can you talk a little bit about, about the, how important focus is to being successful as a business owner? Yeah, I can tell you, I have terrible focus. I'm a procrastinator. If I need to lose weight, I'm not going to eat right. I'm not going to work out. I'm going to think I should. I'm going to put it in my head. Yes, sounds like a great plan. And then at the end of the day, I'm just going to do everything I always do. No change happens with me until I force the focus to occur. 
And I think a lot of us are like, we have these ideas, these wants, these desires. And at the end of the day, if a patient shows up in front of us, we just go and cut teeth and forget about everything else. So I'm a big believer in business and in life that success comes from daily habits. It does not come from this one time event, typically. You know, like I'm not going to have a great relationship with my kids because I took them to Disney World one time. You know, I, I'm going to have a great relationship with my five kids when I play with them for an hour every day and I have that daily habit. And that is how it works in dentistry. If we look at the habits a CEO should have, they should have habits of, revolved around auditing, uh, habits around um, tracking of the numbers and implementation of new systems, of connecting with their teams. Uh, looking at goals and financials and marketing and all of this can be laid out as a list of habits. And we lay out that list of habits as here's what you do every day, every week and every month. One sheet of paper is the CEO checklist of what to do. And now all I have to remember as a CEO is one thing. Look at the freaking sheet of paper. And I don't have to have emotional uh, space tied up with it. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to wait for something to blow up in my face. I know that for the, half, the first half hour of every morning, I'm going to be a CEO. And all I'm going to do is my little sheet of paper. And that little sheet of paper gives me the focus to do what everyone else isn't doing. The audits and the tracking and the implementation that make me a ton of money over my career and that really create a great environment for my patients and my staff that no one else is doing. I make way more money in those 30 minutes than I do cutting another damn tooth. So I, my approach to focus is to make it super easy, no brainer, just sit down and do one sheet of paper a day. And if that's the only habit we got, we can take home a million bucks for sure. So th like I said, this was awesome content. Um, I want to ask you a couple of questions um, through my lightning round. Um, and the very first question, you, which was really funny, is what habits have made you most successful? <laughs> Which is a really funny question. That, <laughs> so I think you just stated that pretty pretty successfully here. Is that one sheet of paper, you put all your notes down. Is there anything else you can add to that? Yeah, you know, I, I think I mentioned auditing. Auditing is an incredibly important, quick, little, simple habit that has made me incredibly successful. Auditing um, causes implementation to stick. Auditing causes us to find problems when they're tiny. Auditing is quality control. Auditing is oversight. It's letting everyone know that it's important that we're watching. Auditing gives me peace of mind when I go to bed. Auditing gives me information I need to promote people and to celebrate people. It's a very important habit to have in business, I think. Also for me, what's important to do is once a quarter, I have the habit of reassessing where I am and what I need to do. I don't want to get caught winning the wrong game, you know, getting really good at winning the whole wrong game. So once a quarter, I'm like, okay, wait, where am I personally, professionally, the company? I do this, what I call strategic plan once a quarter, pretty straightforward where I'm reevaluating what we're doing and what do we need to do this next quarter? What are the most important things that we have to get done this next quarter? Another habit that's important for me is that if my, if my personal life isn't healthy, it's really hard to have my business life healthy. So I become selfish in my personal life. I have a day a week I go out with my friends. I have a mandatory two date nights a week with my wife. Mandatory. If we don't do it, I'm mad at her. Mandatory. I need to be reminded that we're romantic and we're totally into each other and we're going to have time together. Um, and I have very similar things like that. You know, 20 minutes working out every day. Like all these little habits I have to have in my personal life so that I have the emotional energy and drive to accomplish better things on the business side. That's awesome. I love that. How do you define success? You know, that's a really hard question to answer. Um, I, I don't know if we ever get there. I think success is really the feeling that we're achieving things on the right path. Uh, because I can tell you, every time I won a race, I was ready to run the bigger race next. You know, I, I never really finished any race. I kept running. So I think really success comes from saying, you know what, we're getting better. And, and that feels right. It feels good. It gives us confidence and happiness and stability and strength. Now, it is important to define what feeling better is from quarter to quarter or year to year so that we have a finish line. But I don't know if anyone ever quits racing. I think we all in life just keep racing bigger and bigger races. So success to me means we're, we're, we're 
reaching finish lines and feeling like we are growing in life. Perfect. What are you most excited about at work right now? Oh, at, uh, right now, I mean, there's a lot of things to be excited about at work. So first of all, well, first of all, COVID's kind of died down. So now I'm giving all of my, these intense uh, two-day training events. I'm now, we're ramping up. I'm very busy traveling country, uh, sold out rooms, and it's fun. I love doing that. I'm also, I coach a small group of uh, incredibly successful dentists personally, one-on-one. I'm their private coach. That I love. Also, what's happening on work is that artificial intelligence is really starting to change things when it comes to answering a phone and analyzing marketing all the way to where's the decay on the x-ray and how much bone loss do we have? Um, you know, we're having uh, IBM Watson computer. We're training IBM Watson not just to listen to the conversation, but to talk back to a patient using Alexa's voice on the phone and scheduling in real time. And all of that technology is becoming very exciting because it takes away friction. Friction that we have in managing and training people and finding people, friction patients have in trying to get scheduled, friction that we have in finding this financial success that we're looking for. It's very exciting. Love that. What's the smartest investment you've ever made? I'm curious your answer to this. <laughs> um, it doesn't necessarily have to be like a stock. What it, you, You've made investments in some things, so it, will, it could be something. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. I can tell you that. What I, my smartest is probably not what I would recommend. So the smartest investment I ever made is building companies even when they failed because it kept me moving forward on learning and growing and driving and finding new answers to life and to dentistry. I believe that the smartest investment people typically make around me are investing in knowledge. So um, soaking up as a sponge, the knowledge, the latest knowledge they can find. That was not the case for me because at the time I started doing everything I was doing, that knowledge wasn't readily available. And I was in a freaking wheelchair trying to uh, not implode in my life emotionally and financially. So I went down a path where I invested a ton of my money and time into building companies and I learned knowledge that way. But that is a hard way to do it. I really feel like investing in knowledge is probably the smartest thing because it changes how you see the world. Now, the problem a lot of people have, though, is they might get the right knowledge, but they don't invest in people to actually make them do it. So let me say that, too. You know, if I have to lose weight and get healthy, it's not enough to know I got to eat right and work out. I need to hire someone to make my meals. I need to hire someone to say, Scott, get the hell down and lift the weights up. Because if someone doesn't say that to me, I'm not going to do it. And that is a massive ROI. When you invest in people that create the environment you need to become your best self, that's an awesome investment. So two more questions. If This is interesting. I haven't asked this one of anybody yet. If you had to open up a lemonade stand tomorrow, what would you call the stand? <laughs> Where do you get these questions? All right. <laughs> I happen to, if I had to open up a lemonade stand, what would I call it? Um, well, today I'd say lemonade for Ukraine and we would sell a ton of lemonade to raise money for the Ukraine. And my kids would understand how to run that volume. And hopefully the real lemonade stand they'd have 20 years later that they might call a smoothie location will, will, will be better. I love that. Um, I can tell you right now, I'd pick a cause that meant something for a small little thing like a lemonade stand. And I would give my kids the experience in doing something they felt like was for greater good while still also having this experience of entrepreneurship. That's awesome. And last question. If you had to pick any book that you'd recommend somebody read, what book would it be? Um, here's the problem. I don't read books. <laughs> so um, I can tell you that I can't, I can't recommend a single book. But what I do recommend is whether you're listening or reading, or actually physically following someone, pick someone that is doing something great at a large sample size that you can learn from. So um, I'm a big believer in the, the notion that the people we're around and the voices we let into our heads really impact where we are in life, the path we take. So I would say find people through books or podcasts or in person that have the truths of success 
And those truths don't come from this one lucky blind swing on a curveball that happened to hit a home run. It comes from huge sample sizes of them doing it over and over and over again. That's where the truths lie. And that's what I would recommend people try to go find. That's amazing. Um, Scott, uh, we were actually over time, but I didn't, I wanted to get to you. You were like, I'm talking, I've done 200 plus episodes of this. And honestly, I've never enjoyed an episode as more, as much as this. I have to be honest with you. I'm not just, not just blowing smoke up your butt. I'm, I'm being oh, truthful. Awesome. Thank you. This was absolutely amazing. So, um, if anybody has any questions, they want to get in touch with you or, or learn more about what you do for practices. How do they do that? Breakawayseminar.com breakawayseminar.com. You can email us through there. You can see the courses I give. You can just learn what my face looks like. I don't care, but go there and, and, and we can help you at that website. Awesome. Scott, this was amazing. Like I said, um, if you enjoyed this episode, guys, and I'm sure you did, please recommend it. Please share it. Please subscribe. Uh, please keep listening. Episodes come out Friday at uh, five o'clock in the morning, uh, 5 a.m. in the morning. And um, you know, this was this was amazing content. I'm, I'm so, so, so excited. <laughs> I don't get that way normally, but this was great. And uh, remember, your reputation matters. Till the next episode of the Raving Patients podcast. Scott, thank you so much for sharing your advice with the audience. Thank you so much for having me. It was awesome.